Hello, everyone. Dr. Yonit Arthur here. You are on The Steady Coach, and it is my great honor and very exciting to bring you this interview today with Ari Borinsky. In this interview, we are discussing psychedelic assisted therapy and the potential that it has to help people with chronic medically unexplained physical symptoms like chronic dizziness and chronic pain. You've heard me talk about this on my channel before, and you have already heard me say this, but Ari and I discuss at length the potential that both of us think that this kind of therapy has for helping people like you who are dealing with chronic dizziness and chronic pain. Now, Ari is a licensed clinical social worker and very highly trained in psychedelic assisted therapy. He currently has a private practice in Brooklyn where he administers ketamine assisted psychotherapy, but he's also trained in psilocybin, MDMA, and plant medicine assisted psychotherapy for people with all sorts of conditions, but in particular, people with chronic physical symptoms because Ari himself has recovered from one. Ari had chronic back pain that was highly debilitating, and he is now living a back pain-free life with the help of the work that he's done with psychedelic medicines. So I think you'll find this interview very interesting and enlightening. And of course, if you have questions or comments, I look forward to hearing about them in the comments section. And if you enjoy this interview, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel or podcast. It helps me get messages like this out to more people. Please enjoy. All right, Ari, thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to talk to you, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to come talk to me about this amazing topic today. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. So I was wondering if you could start by just telling us a little bit about you, your background, what you do. Sure. I am a licensed clinical social worker based in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And I currently have a smallish private practice um, in the neighborhood where I live. And uh, yeah, I have like a 15 to 20 uh, patient caseload currently. Um, I, uh, well, I've been in the field now of social work for 10 years about. Mm -hmm. um, I was a uh, Peace Corps volunteer right out of college and um, spent time living in Central America. And uh, without knowing it, when you're a Peace Corps volunteer, you're, you're basically doing international social work. Um, and so I came back to New Jersey where I'm from and I uh, decided, I was working at an immigrant resource center and I decided I wanted to go to law school because people kept coming and saying they needed to see the immigration lawyer. And I studied and worked hard and got into the school that I wanted to go to that had the immigration justice clinic. And I started my program. And within a couple of weeks, I dropped out and just really felt into um, like the first depressive episode, essentially of my life. And um, started to see a therapist and started to learn and think about uh, just how difficult the transition was for me to come back to this society and this world after having essentially been on, you know, a very different kind of, uh, energy frequency for so long, uh, so much more community, so much more love, purpose, meaning, all that stuff. Um, so I had a bit of a quarter life crisis at that point around, uh, 26 and curiously, I started to feel better sort of psychologically. But that's when my chronic back pain started. Um, and that was confusing because I didn't have a, there wasn't a moment where I was like in the gym and boom, then my back, you know. Um, so uh, I found the field of social work uh, eventually and decided to get uh, a master's in social work because uh, it was much more aligned than law school with what I had been doing. Um, and I um, did that in New York and then I graduated and uh, worked for a psychiatrist in Queens for five years in a clinic that um, kind of has a, a community mental health feel, 
although it's a private practice. So um, we were able to um, have a break on the paperwork, uh, but we were seeing Medicaid patients, um, lots, lots of diverse kinds of presenting problems, diverse caseload, just doing a lot of talk therapy in Spanish. The, the psychiatrist I was working for is a native of Argentina. Um, and that's sort of really where I sort of cut my teeth as a, as a therapist and, um, simultaneously, you know, accrued my clinical hours to, to be independently licensed and decided to also pursue some, um, postgraduate, you know, training opportunities, um, some of which are directly, you know, um, relevant to mind, body medicine and psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're here to talk to us about. So yeah. we're going to. We're going to dig into that. But first, before we do that, I contacted you after hearing you interviewed for a different podcast. And I told you before we went on air that the reason I contacted you was because you were talking about your back pain experience. And I remember hearing you saying this. And then my friend gave me this book and I was like, it was Sarno. And then you said, it was by this guy named Dr. Sarno. And I was so excited. So it, you, at this point, you mentioned you've, you've experienced chronic back pain and now using mind-body methods with the assistance of psychedelics, you are now out of that cycle, right? You're out of the back pain? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell me a little more about what it was like for you kind of coming in, trained as a social worker, hearing some of the things Sarno was saying? Was that outlandish? Was that did that line up with your training? What was that like? Um, <laughs> no, it didn't. Um, I couldn't quite piece it all together. The, the, the academic part of my degree was very light on uh, um, trauma, really, trauma-informed care and nervous system um, rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure I went, you know, and, and, and I went to a good school for my master's program, but I don't think I heard the words nervous system for two years in academia. You know, in, in, I, 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 I found my way to hearing them essentially in the, in the clinic that I was working in my second year, which was a family therapy, you know, clinic. Mm -hmm. um, but um, no, this was not, you know, nobody was talking about this stuff really. And I don't know if they are now, but Hopefully, you know, it's the field has changed for sure, for sure. And, and it's still shifting, hopefully. But mm -hmm. um, I did take a training right after graduating in uh, an approach to a, a psycho uh, somatic psychotherapy modality called sensory motor psychotherapy, which is the sister, yes. the cousin to somatic experiencing. Yes. You know, it's basically, it's all the same stuff, variations on the same theme. Mm -hmm. And so I started to use some of that um, those interventions, those tools with some clients and, and really started to see people, um, improve essentially, and have some real deeper shifts in their energy levels and in their, um, in terms of reducing symptoms with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, that was really like enlightening and inspiring. Um, but I couldn't still at the time apply any of that to my own story. It didn't, it was just like, that's like work and, they're coming for PTSD and I don't, I've never had that diagnosis. So this can't be me. So, you know, I was still in the dark with that stuff. So what did it take for you to start realizing, okay, this well, is it, this is the okay, truth trauma is, related. Yeah. The truth is I remember this very well. I mean, memory is a funny thing, especially when psychedelics and medicines are involved, yeah. but there, there, my, my stepdad had given me a copy of, I think Sarno's first book, just like healing back pain or whatever. And he had heard about it from Howard Stern. He's a big Howard Stern fan and Howard Stern had gave Dr. Sarno a whole eulogy. It's on YouTube. It's, it's worth watching because he credits, you know, Dr. Sarno with essentially saving his life. He talks about how he used to, there was a period in the eighties when he was, he would do his radio show laying on his back because he couldn't sit in a chair. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's a pretty powerful celebrity endorsement. Um, mm. And I had an experience with MDMA, um, just out with friends, you know, in, in, in Brooklyn one night and for whatever, and, and my back pain disappeared and it didn't come back right away in the morning. 
And then like the book that I had been given, the Sarno book was sort of like, there's like a halo around it, you know, on the, on the bookshelf, it sort of called <laughs> to me and I read it. And then it really, and then it, that was the first time I had skimmed it before, but again, you know, the protector parts are all there doing their thing. And, you know, I, I it, it didn't penetrate, none of it penetrated and, and none of it resonated. And then once I was in this afterglow of this MDMA experience, I was able to read it and it started to make sense to me. I was like, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Um, but sure enough, it didn't really stick still. And I continued with um, cycles of pain. You know, my, my pain, like a lot of people's chronic pain, it's like, well, three days on, three days, not quite as much, not gone. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. three days on, and you know, mm -hmm. so that's where I was um, for the next year or so, I guess you know, or at least until finding my, my way to, to Peru to do deeper, deeper me medicine work, essentially. Mm -hmm. So already, and we're here obviously to talk more about the potential for psychedelics to be used in the treatment of mind body disorders, like chronic mm -hmm. dizziness and chronic pain. So already we're talking about one checkpoint where it could be helpful. And that first checkpoint is at the point when someone's having a hard time wrapping his or her mind around the idea that this could actually be relevant. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, there's an incredible loosening mechanism of sorts that psychedelics offer, mm -hmm. um, loosening of the, um, I mean, there's so many different words to insert there, right? We, we loosen, they, they help us to loosen, um, the grip that the, the psyche has on its own narrative, really, mm -hmm. you know, this led to that and this led to this. And then maybe there's a big question mark in people's stories and they're, they can't. And that question mark is really a problem for them because they need to know they need to be, they need to be certain about something about the, related to their symptoms. And so psychedelics come in and they, you know, offer us this window into for, for some, for some of us, depending on the journey, into a place of uh, remembering that they don't have to know everything um, or some deeper felt sensory sense of, wow, things are going to be okay. Things are going to work out for me. You know, I'm not this cycle. The, so, something is different, just quite, you know, it's a very black, that, that, that part is very black and white in, 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 the, in the crux, you know, of a, of a psychedelic journey. Something mm -hmm. is very different. Um, and, and even that for somebody who's chronically depressed or suffering with chronic pain is enough to start to tilt, you know, the seesaw, so to speak in the direction of, of healing and, and growth. That is, is such a great point. So even although you and I are going to be delving much more deeply today into emotional and trauma work and why that's the real power of psychedelics mm. to, to help open those boxes for people and really really rewire the nervous system from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that even for people who may not be as interested or don't need to delve as deeply, it can still, as you said, loosen some of the, those, that need for certainty that mm -hmm. I see in a lot of people with chronic dizziness and chronic pain and allow them to accept that gray area and move forward with a mind body method. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. So you were telling the story. So why don't we continue with, with the story, with your story? And then from there, we'll learn more about your experience and, and your professional experience with psychedelics. So you sure. said you, you went down to Peru. Yeah. Yeah. So this I, was I, in... I, I, the, the backstory there is I had been working for a psychiatrist for three years while accruing my clinical hours to become licensed myself. Once I did that, the psychiatrist and I decided to start a uh, separate practice together, um, working with a different sort of population, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to look for offices for that practice. And again, synchronistically, um, I was connected to somebody who owned a building, it turns out is, you know, connected to a very 
dear family friend of mine in New Jersey. And you, oh, you got to go look at this building. It was in my neighborhood. I was like, oh, that's interesting. It's a, it's a cool building, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the, 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 the manager of that building met me and um, was showing me a couple different office spaces. And at that point, I, that, was a, that was a rough day for me with my back pain, I remember. And I was telling him, like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still feeling, I'm, whatever. I told him a little bit about my back pain and about the fact that I, um, maybe, I maybe I had just read Michael Pollan's book or something, or maybe I had, I would, for whatever reason, psychedelics came up and it was just this sort of like understanding that we, 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 we both, you know, are, appreciate psychedelics or whatever, mm -hmm. but within like 10 or 15 minutes of talking to him, he just sort of cuts me off and he goes, you've tried ayahuasca, right? And I was like, no. And I hadn't really even heard the word that much. I heard it, I had heard it, but I didn't really know what it was about. Um, this must've been before Michael Pollan's book, by the way. Um, and the way he, he just sort of, he just very, in a, in a very direct manner said, oh, you have to go to Blue Morpho. You know, they'll take care of your back pain for you. And um, for whatever reason, he said it and it just, it really, it sunk in, you know? And um, truthfully, at that point, just like I'm sure many of your patients, like the cycle, the ups and downs of, of, of chronic pain lead people to a place where they really, they lead from their desperate parts in life. So desperation of sorts is not pretty, but it is a motivator. It is a really powerful motivator to try new interventions. And so at that point I was like, mm -hmm. well, I, I really have nothing to lose. Um, I'm comfortable in Latin America. I, 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 I can, you know, I can, I can handle whatever this is essentially. It's another adventure. It's another pilgrimage of sorts. Um, I looked online, the guy, the place that he had recommended was, was reputable. Um, and that's how I went, you know, for the first time. And I think it was January of 2018, mm -hmm. uh, to a retreat. Mm -hmm. And gosh, I, I'm sure we could spend an hour just, just yeah. breaking down that experience. The, the, the summary of that experience was four ayahuasca ceremonies, Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. And the third ceremony on the Thursday night was the one that really, um, there was a clear before and after with respect to my back pain. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the one where I went up for the second cup and uh, was thrown into a very, very terrifying, um, what's the movie with the, 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 the girls, she's, the girl's head spins around and. Um, oh, the exorcist. The exorcist. Yeah. I had, a, I had an exorcism. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The yeah. demons were exorcised out of me, which happens to be what, the shamans believe mm -hmm. anyway, right? Mm -hmm. The energies that we pick up in life mm -hmm. have to be um, kind of, I mean, they, they sing to you so that, so that they clean your energy body. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the language that they use. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sure enough, that's essentially what happened. And I stood up after um, I came back to, to this dimension and I did a, I did a forward bend and I had, I had no back pain mm. and it was, wild and i was laughing i did a lot of laughing mm -hmm. that night you know which just just came out you know mm -hmm. um and so that was another step serious step towards you know writing writing the the, the ship of sorts um but it didn't stick is the truth i came back home I, d I had no plan for integration i walked right back into a very stressful work situation that was really unexpected actually and some family stuff came up and just life, life happened, you know, and, and was waiting for me back in the matrix. And I had no real way of, you know, um, of, of integrating again, to use that term. I did make one dear friend, my friend Francisco, who I met in at that retreat center and he was living in New York and he was my only connection. Mm -hmm. who, the only person I could be like, oh, do you remember what just happened and what we did and what's really going on in the spirit world? And, you know, but, um, and it was very helpful, but it but it wasn't enough to, to keep the demons at bay, so to speak. I'm so happy that you're speaking to this because I'm, as we again discussed before we went on air, I think psychedelics are an incredible new frontier and they will bring so much healing to people with chronic dizziness and chronic pain. But I think that there's already a mistaken belief 
because of the Western model of medicine, that the medicine is doing something or the medicine is doing the work or that by taking the medicine, you're rewiring your brain and then you're going to wander off and everything's going to be fine. And yeah. that is, that wasn't the case for you. And I don't think that's going to be the case for other people either. Yeah. It, that's a, it's, it's a very rare phenomenon when that, when that comes to pass. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't even, th I mean, I don't even know that I've met anybody. Maybe I've read accounts like that. Mm -hmm. so to speak, but I don't know that I've met anybody for whom that's, that's their truth. One journey, you know, and that's not what the research is suggesting either. The research no. on maps and stuff like that. So, um, you know, uh, we'll have to see, we will have to, it, yeah, we're, this is very nascent stuff, as you know. So mm -hmm. we're about a year and change, maybe a year and three months away from MDMA being, you know, rescheduled and, um, you know, yeah, fingers crossed we can, mm -hmm. We can touch on that at some point. I'm very, very excited to to get to work with that medicine in particular. I have a lot of thoughts about how and why that medicine is um, the golden the golden ticket, you know, uh, of sorts for so many people. Yes, agreed. Um, and so uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how it all unfolds. And psilocybin, they're saying maybe a year after, hopefully. Yeah, that's yeah. what they're saying. And, yeah. and you, know, you can go. People can go now to Oregon in Colorado and find themselves in a therapeutic environment with a licensed whatever practitioner and they can have those experiences already. Oregon rolled out their state sponsored program, sanctioned program this year in 2023 in January. Amazing. And uh, Colorado, they all, they just voted to, you know, I, I believe they voted to legalize, not even decrim, you know, mm -hmm. uh, these medicines. So, yeah, there are options. And of course, there are, op there are international, you know, options and retreat options and stuff to work with. with there medicine. are, mm -hmm. but speaking to your point and in, in your story, yeah, flying away somewhere and having a wonderful therapeutic session or spiritual session doesn't stick. So maybe you can talk to me more about what your process was. Yeah. And then it's, it's interesting. I've, you know, I've been able to meditate on this a lot and talk yeah. to clients about it. So there are pros and cons to the pilgrimage experience, you know, the archetypal pilgrimage experience for people. The biggest pro that I see is the physical and psychological distance that people actually get when they get on an airplane, they get off an airplane, they get on, a, a, you know, it's wherever you're doing, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, you know, just to mm -hmm. get these places where you're going to have the healing experiences. So the placebo that's involved in that. Um, and they're prioritizing themselves. I mean, exactly. You've, you've read Sarno's work. You know, you know, my people, you know, our, our people, they, sure, they're sure. like these incredibly conscientious, the good loving is, people, yeah. good, goodists who do things yeah. for everyone else except for themselves. So this is an act of, of, as you say, sometimes out of desperation, but an act of self care mm -hmm. for them. That's actually quite powerful, I think too. For sure, for sure. And, you know, and so it's everything that we just mentioned that goes into that experience. And then the fact that literally their cell phone's not going to work in the middle of the jungle. So the opportunity to be triggered by your primary partner or whoever it is who might mm -hmm. get a hold of you, your boss, whatever, you know, and that's, that's not for everybody. Not everybody is in a place in their lives where they can just not have cell phone service or whatever mm -hmm. for five days. But it's something to consider, right? When we, if we really zoom out and we think about what well, a bigger picture here, um, you know, it's very, it's very nuanced. It's very nuanced work. So of course, that person is going to have a hard, a harder time integrating because they show up in their community and they're kind of alone with that experience, which you know, which doesn't exist in traditional societies where. They use, you know, traditional Amazonian plant medicines, of course, like the, the shamans, like your neighbor, you know, right. and is there for you after afterwards, available at different points to, to help you, essentially. Yeah. Um, but but the flip side to that is if you if you drive, if you get in your car and you drive 30 minutes to the ketamine clinic or the psychedelic clinic and you come right out of that experience, four to six hour experience, and you jump right back into old patterns you know, and uh, who, who knows what's waiting for you at home. That's also not ideal for, mm -hmm. for, for you know, the process. <laughs> yeah. So 
we kind of and and the research that's being done with, at maps with mdma for example it, you know people spend the night right and they, and they integrate the next day right you know? and so it's very involved well so let's let's pause for a moment and just sure. explain why this might be problematic so what i know i'm jumping way ahead here but what and this is a huge question but ultimately, if someone is in chronic pain or has chronic physical symptoms like chronic dizziness, what is our goal with psychedelic assisted therapy? Like what, what is the hope? What are we actually helping their nervous systems do? Well, I mean, we use this term where there, there are regulated nervous systems and there are dysregulated mm -hmm. nervous systems. Um, and every time I type a word document with, with the word dysregulated, oh, yeah. <laughs> It doesn't, it underlines it and says, that's not a word. Yeah. <laughs> Same. yeah like, that's what I learned at my training. That's what mm -hmm. I learned at my somatic, you know, psychotherapy training. So yeah. somebody thinks it's a word. And I've always, I've sort of uh, dreamed of a future when we have some sort of device that gets us to a place where we're like getting a number, like a reading for humans as to just how dysregulated a person's autonomic nervous system is. Um, cause then we could go, aha, I have the proof. Here's the proof of all my trauma and whatnot and all my current mm -hmm. symptoms and my dizziness and my pain or whatever it is, but we're not there and we may never be there. Um, mm -hmm. you know, because these are invisible, these are invisible wounds, you know, psychic injuries, trauma and injury are very much invisible to the naked eye. They don't show up under a microscope. Um, now, you know, and, and neuroscience is really not, it, it's only so helpful, right? We're not, we're not in a place where we're giving everybody fMRI, you know, scans and explaining to them, oh, here's the area of your brain where we can tell that you have a trauma history and here's the area of your brain, you know, that's a whole other, there are, there are alternative therapies out there and neurofeedback and biofeedback and brain training, but that's, that's just not where we're at collectively right now. It's mm -hmm. not accessible for most people. Um, so yeah so that so the so the medicines the psychedelics we like we, we we say they create the conditions necessary for a person's nervous system mind spirit and oftentimes body to regulate itself to start a process by which it regulates itself mm -hmm. and um and it's very uh it's not linear mm -hmm. it's not a linear process um sure but, but it can be done. Sure. Be done and it's beautiful to witness. Sure. Sure. Okay. So if our goal then is, and we, again, this is something, anyone who's seen other videos on my channel, we, we talk about this a lot that again, in a very simplified way, we talk about the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. We talk about the connected or rest and digest response. And we talk yeah. about how a, a, a nervous system that's regulated, it's it's able to switch freely from state to state. It's not that it's really in one state or the other, it's that it switches from state to state, it doesn't get stuck in one state. Right. So what you're saying is that one of the overarching goal of, of psychedelic assisted therapy is to help someone's nervous system get back into this healthy state that allows it to switch from, from, from state to state, depending on the circumstances and not get, get stuck in one or the other. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think okay. one word that, 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 that analogy reminds me of, um, it's like Gabor Mate. Are you, you do, do you? Very familiar. <laughs> yeah. You know, he yeah. talks about the fact that tra childhood trauma cuts us off from our intuition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and our, your intuition is basically it rep represents the health of your nervous system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've come mm -hmm. to believe, you know, so people who talk about not trusting themselves, not trusting their gut, you know, oh, I don't, I don't really trust my gut. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've a lot of, you know, X, Y, and Z have led me to where I'm at. And so, um, the psychedelic experience does something, you know, gives us opportunities to do something really profound there. And people come out of them with a different sense of being able to trust themselves, the universe, their place in the world, make peace with the past, um, process guilt, start to grieve. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's a profound sort of grieving process that people undergo usually once they're on the other side of maybe the, the turbulence 
-hmm. you know, turbulent part of psychedelic journeys. I like to think of them a lot of times as like you drop off all these bags that have been weighing you down in life. You know, one of which is like a, a sack full of guilt that people feel mm -hmm. for reasons. And once you do that, you move into a space where the grieving, you know, which is just, you know, you just emote. Mm -hmm. And that could be spontaneous laughter, like it was for me with the ayahuasca session. It could be crying. It could be an expression of anger, mm -hmm. adaptive anger that's been stored up and pent up. And so and, interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting I'll, that I'll, you're touching I'll, on this. Favorite, you know, emotion to, to, you know, focus on was, it was anger, right? He, he really thought that that was at the root repressed anger of, of the mm -hmm. chronic, you know, symptoms as did Freud, by the way, that mm -hmm. was, he thought that rage, it's yeah. all about the rage. Yeah. 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 Well, it's I talk, important. it's important. It's not, yeah. it's not, it's not. And, and, and again, it's something I talk about a lot here too, that Amer so I'm not sure how familiar you are with emotional awareness and expression therapy. It's, it's one of the it's it's kind of the next gen of some of Sarno's work where okay, cool. it's not just anger, it's it's also helping people express and feel guilt, sadness. But my my what I'm getting at here is what I hear from people frequently is you need how how do I process emotions? Like how do I how do I actually get to them? Mm -hmm. And you you mentioned two different things. First, you mentioned that there's a spontaneous um release or processing sometimes of some of these emotions. But the mm -hmm. other thing you said, I think is even more interesting to me. You said that there's a, a certainty or a, an, an okayness with the lack of certainty that people tend to have after mm -hmm. a journey or during a journey. Yeah. And to me, that's kind of the central feature of chronic dizziness and chronic pain that um, pe people are, are being driven to have some of these personality traits or strategies that we talk about, the perfectionism, et cetera, the, ang the anxiety, the obsession with due to kind of this fundamental lack of connectedness to themselves, this lack of certainty with themselves. So to me, that is a, also a really big component of people's healing for them, even just to experience that connectedness. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's where, we get to use, you know, language that is kind of closer to spirituality, mm -hmm. essentially, I, I, I think, you know, and most people are comfortable with that language once they've had a powerful psychedelic experience. You know, that's, this is the realm of transpersonal psychology, mm -hmm. you know, beyond, beyond personality, beyond ego. Yes. And, um, you know, and sure enough, um, I mean, that's, that's a whole other, <laughs> there's, you know, learning about, uh, your patients, uh, associations with their own sense of spirituality and perhaps religiosity, because sometimes they go hand in hand, sometimes you know, yeah, it's, um, it's always an interesting, uh, project, you know? Yeah. And, and so, uh, it's all, it's all relevant, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and there are, there are those in the mind body world um, who I've also been really wanting to talk to who, who specifically talk about chronic pain and chronic dizziness and some of these other chronic conditions specifically as a spiritual crisis, not just as a, an emotional crisis or a psychological crisis, yes. but rather a spiritual crisis. I use the, the mind body spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, tri triangle um, pyramid a, a, a lot. And, and I have clients who are good at um, targeting, they, they understand how to intervene on a mind level. They're pretty mm -hmm. good at it, or they understand yes. how to intervene on a body level. And, and then, and then they're, at a, they're at a loss when it comes to spirit. What is spirit? I don't feel spirit. That's, 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 that's not science, that's, or whatever it is, right? Or maybe they're so, maybe it's, it's the opposite and they're like super spiritual so to speak, but they're not in their bodies. They don't live in their bodies. You yes. Know? They're dissociated from their bodies. And so thinking, thinking this way, and again, using that, sometimes we have to think in those terms and sometimes we have to feel in those terms. And I, I do always reinforce the idea with clients that we do not think our way out of chronic states of anything. We do not think our way out of chronic anxiety or chronic depression or addictions 
or disordered eating or whatever it is, we feel our way out. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so that's, that's tricky stuff for some people. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's especially tricky when the general recommendation, even for, even for those enlightened physicians who see people from my world with chronic dizziness, mm -hmm. they'll recommend CBT to these folks. Yeah. Yes. And, <laughs> and be, I am all about behavioral stuff. Like yeah. by all means, use those tools. I talk about them a yeah. ton. Yeah. <laughs> it is not it's not the answer for many people yeah, because yeah. it's not really very, the problem. Very surface level. Right. And so yeah. I, I also, every once in a while, I'll never like, I'll never have an agenda with a client, so to speak, that is, that is based on CBT and CBT um, philosophy essentially. But I will catch myself saying things organically and then I'll go and that's cognitive behavioral therapy for you in a nutshell. Right. And watch out for the all or nothing thinking, right? Watch out for the language. And okay, so you just said something. What's the evidence? Is there evidence to suggest that what you just said is actually true? Mm -hmm. Or is that actually, you know, is, does your past, you know, your record and your history in life not, not, not link, not align with, mm -hmm. with, your, with the truth that you're arriving at today? So all those, you know, they're, they're helpful and sure. they are uh, important lessons that keep us, um, intervening again, just above the surface. And they don't ever touch, you know, the Freud's iceberg of the subconscious and unconscious layers yes. of, um, of, of, of life and personality and human experience. That's, that's my perspective too, but that's, I think, I'm sorry about the noise. If you hear that, of course, the, there's a person pressure washing my window right outside right now. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, so Okay, so now I, I want to bring us back to your journey. So now that we've meandered over here and we've made the case for the fact that we're trying to do a lot more than just rewire your responses to your pain. Yeah. What what made it stick for you? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, let's see. A number of factors, really. Um, I, I did. I did actually work with a um, kind of a, a Sarno trained psychotherapist mm -hmm. um, who helped me to uh, connect the dots, really, um, and gave me the confirmation and validation that I was, you know, looking for it's that's, 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 that's what's so strange about this process, at least for me. And I think for, for some people is it's, it's not enough for us to come to be pain-free and know that this has always been a psychophysiological thing. There must be some sense of, um, validation. You, you need, you need this knowledge validated by other people. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which makes sense from a developmental psychology perspective, because everything about the way your nervous system develops and, and wires to your brain has to do with, um, it's ne nothing ever happens in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You know, we are in incredibly dependent on these energy exchanges in life, you know, and psychic resonance. And, and I mean, this is why in part psychotherapy is helpful at all. Um, so, you know, there's just something, um, very curious about having this, uh, these ideas kind of validated, um, and letting, and letting it really sink in, you know, and mm -hmm. that has, that, that, that offers a, a kind of staying power, um, that, that you wouldn't get if you just are writing in your journal or, you know, holding your truth essentially by yourself. So mm -hmm. uh, that was one piece of the puzzle for me. Um, I ended up doing more work, you know, with, with, with ayahuasca, I went much deeper down the, the, the rabbit hole. I found my way to, um, another, um, brilliant book that is, um, I, I, I don't know if you heard me talking. Do you know who Joe Tefer is? Mm -mm. Yeah, you are. No, I'm, I'm a little obsessed with this phenomenon in life where a person goes to medical school um, 
and starts to work in their field. Uh, they're special, they're, they're, they, you know, they specialize in an area of medicine and then they become disillusioned. Um, hey, so I mean, <laughs> this it is, wasn't medical school, but it was uh, a lot of school. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so I just think it's really, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, I appreciate those individuals ability to blend and synthesize the traditional medical model uh, learning and knowledge that they have with whatever new information they've come across that they have found even more also very helpful. And so in some cases, even more helpful, such as, you know, what Dr. Sarno stumbled across. Mm -hmm. um, so Joe Tefer stumbled across something uh, essentially akin to that, but just, um, uh, you know, much more grounded in anthropology, essentially, and shamanism. Um, he, his story, as he, as he describes in his book, is he got depressed during medical school. He found his way to a Native American church in Arizona and, and, and part, uh, participated in a, um, a peyote ceremony and credited that experience with really shifting um, his, you know, really just clearing his energy field essentially. Um, and he went on to, to complete his residency. And then afterwards he, he went down to Peru um, and, and, did, and, and took a deep dive. He's Colombian American and he had already had experiences in the Colombian Amazon. And, you know, he kind of feels like he was destined to go down and, and find this shaman and, and work um, and learn from this particular shaman in a particular lineage. And he did that um, 2011, 2012. And then he basically, he and a couple other um, healing professionals set up a, 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 an ayahuasca center. Um, and they were receiving guests for many years living down there. And so the first half of his book is his own story. And the second half is just, the second half, it would be really interesting for your patients because it's all case studies. And the case studies are very, there's a big variety in terms of symptomology and presenting problems. So sure, there's a guy who shows up with PTSD from the Iraq war, but then there are people who are showing up with all different sorts of quote unquote physical ailments, including chronic irritable bowel syndrome and different sorts of skin conditions, autoimmune disorders, all the classic stuff that you and I know are rooted in psychology, so to speak, and trauma. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the, 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 the wisdom tradition of the Shipibo people in the Amazon, they have a system of healing that uh, pretty much is able to handle whatever is thrown at them, essentially. And it involves many other plants besides ay uh, ayahuasca. And so mm -hmm. he described that system in detail. And so anyway, I read that book and I went and I found myself in the jungle and I worked with a, another particular plant. And so... Um, you know, not everybody is going to need to go quite as deep down the rabbit hole as I did to find their way to, you know, sustainable long-term healing. But, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was all part of my, you know, it happened to all part of be part of my journey. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm, and by the way, at that retreat center, as at a side note, the only Dr. Sono book that I had never read, maybe his like second or third one, an old crinkled up copy was waiting, waiting for me. Mm -hmm. So I read it in the hammock in, in between ceremonies and stuff like wow. that. Wow. It really, I was just like, oh yeah, of course this one's here for me. That kind mm. of thing. So, yes. Uh, yeah. All the breadcrumbs, you know, we have to, we have to connect the breadcrumbs in life and follow the bread trail. Yeah. So for, so for you, again, I, I know I'm belaboring this point, but I think it's important. It's not, it wasn't the, the chemical itself. It wasn't the, the chemicals in, in the, in the plant or, or having, you know, some kind of experience, whatever that means. It was, it was digging down and really uncovering your traumas that, uh, that was the, yeah, that was, that, that was also the retreat where I felt deeply into a process of unburdening myself with, um, with, grief mm. essentially relating to a very early childhood loss mm. and so that came out that and, and it doesn't it didn't come out for me during ceremony by the way mm -hmm. um, which is also i think an important point because people will go into a psychedelic experience with whatever medicine and if they didn't have that moment of catharsis during the journey 
they'll sometimes feel like they got gypped and they didn't do it right and right. it's not working. So what the, what 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 medicine, you know, especially Amazonian plant medicine, what they teach us is you're in the medicine space from the time you decide to click on the retreat, you know, the pay button, essentially, you know, you, you, you enter what we call the medicine space and you're there, you're in it, you know, the whole time you're on your retreat and you're in it for weeks afterwards. And so it's, again, it's not linear. So for me and for a lot of people, the emotions and the grief work that I had to do to really go deeper into clearing out this energy blockage that I was feeling that was manifesting itself in my lower back. It came out through journaling and crying in my, um, what's called a tambo, which is just like a little hut that you stay in with mosquito net. Um, you know, and it, and it happened at night, you know, during a rainstorm or whatever. So, um, and I just, you know, I knew, I knew that what was coming out of me psycho spiritually was still linked to my back pain at that point. And I just had to get it out. Mm. Yeah. So, wow. So, I mean, having had this experience yourself, it really doesn't surprise me to hear that you're working with, with patients in this way. Right. But I think people are going to want to know. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, the, the other thing to mention is, you know, Dr. Sarno talks very, this was, this was an issue for me. One of the issues I had with Sarno, and I think a lot of people have when they're trying to figure this stuff out, is he's very adamant about quitting the PT you're doing and quitting the chiropractor you're seeing and quitting, you know, these, these healing interventions in your life. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I don't think that that is true. Actually, I understand what he's saying there because he doesn't, he doesn't want people to give their power away to mm -hmm. these, these, you know, helping professionals essentially, because the power is within essentially. Um, but another thing that happened for me was, um, eventually I started seeing a, a, a chiropractor with a unique kind of training who helped me to, um, I, I the, the psychedelics had already provided me with a base of sorts where I was able to receive this person's interventions and medicine, you know? And so That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they do that. They do that mm -hmm. a lot. And there's this, this documentary on Netflix. It's called the last shaman about a kid who is super, super depressed and suicidal and, um, finds it, you know, decides to make a, a, a documentary about going down to the Amazon to try to figure this stuff out essentially. Mm -hmm. And the story is he works with a lot of different shamans and makes it, makes a significant dent essentially in starting to feel better and working through his trauma. And he comes back home and he's, and he get the end, the end of the documentary is him giving a talk to a group of students at some college or something. And he says, you know what? I came back home and eventually I got back on an SSRI. And everybody was like, wait, I, you went to the jungle, you lived there for six months, you did all this natural plant medicine stuff, and now you're back on a psychiatric medication. And he's like, yeah, but if I hadn't done that, the SSRI wasn't going to work for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not, it's not either or. And so I, I make that point because the chiropractor I was seeing was super helpful as well, you know, mm -hmm. with these little micro adjustments that he was doing. And, and, and the truth is, you know, he, he, has, he does this adjustments where you lean over his body and he kind of holds you like a, like a child. And so mm -hmm. there's all... Mm -hmm. There's all this other energy going right. on. But, right. Uh, and that's, I guess I want to make that point just to kind of counter or give it a different perspective too. The, the people that I see frequently, they're they're going to these clinics where people are t telling them there's something horribly wrong with them. Yeah. And when they're going to, to people who are telling them there's something horribly wrong with them, they're going to be more vulnerable to receiving those messages For sure. um, if, if they're in the process of healing in this way. For so sure. I think, I think again, I, I, I agree completely that we shouldn't write off all of these other interventions, Yeah. but it's also important to understand what, what message are you receiving kind of on a deeper level from the people who are helping you totally. and what message are you giving yourself? In fact, I, I've talked about SSRIs too. Again, that's part of the recommended treatment for, for many of my folks with chronic dizziness yeah. and if it's being used as a, you're broken, take this, it'll fix your broken brain chemistry, then it's, it's, it's not as likely to help as if you say, this is an act of self-compassion for myself to, to help support myself as I work through this process, because this is hard. Exactly. Yeah. Couldn't, yeah. But, couldn't yeah. That's such a great uh, point though. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So, so, okay. So 
So you work with people now as so you had your own experience and now you work with people who have among many other things, sometimes chronic physical symptoms. So I was wondering if you could tell me about some of the things that you see. Yeah. You know, um, you, yeah, I, I have a client right now, um, who is, uh, dealing with a lot of uh, body, um, pain really. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's, it's classic, um, symptom imperative stuff to use the sonar language, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. Oh, as soon as my, as soon as my neck feels better then my knees hurt, and as soon as my knees feel better then you know, it goes right. to my ankles or whatever, which, being a somatically trained therapist, that this makes perfect sense now because when I get people into states of mindfulness where they're tracking the body sensations that are associated with traumatic memory, for example, or an idea, the sensation that they feel shifts and moves, and that's great. So people, I see, you know, um, they're thinking of something that's happened in the past, and I, I, I encourage them to, you know. Um, focus on the sensory experience of, of, of what, you know, and the, so they'll describe it, a tightness in their chest or a pressure in their chest. And then if they're able to just be with it, right. And not judge it essentially and notice it and approach it with curiosity, then it will move from their chest up to their upper neck. Right. Mm -hmm. And they'll go, oh, wow, it's moving right now, you know? Okay. And then you say, okay, is that, is it okay to stay with it? Does it feel is it tolerable? You know, yeah, I don't like it, but it's tolerable, whatever. And eventually, you know, in, in, in the ideal somatic psychotherapy session, that, that energy, that nervous system energy completely leaves, right? The body. And sometimes they actually go into a recalibration, you know, shaking, uh, state. And so, uh, that's incredibly powerful. It's very, it's a very strange, uh, situation that, that they find themselves in essentially, cause they're not, they're not used to it. They don't know what to make of it, mm -hmm. but that's very beautiful. That's sort of like, you know, that's what we're hoping everybody can, can achieve. Um, so like a completion, yes. a completion of a trauma or a completion of an emotion, emotional exactly. response. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. And, yep. and, and, and when I just want to be clear as a side note here, when we say trauma and when we say traumatic memories or emotional memories, we're not necessarily referring to big T trauma, are we? We're, we're talking about even just attachment, like early attachment situations where maybe someone doesn't even have memories of things going wrong. So Gabor says trauma is, um, well, first of all, he says trauma is not what happens to you. It would happen. It's what happens afterwards. It's, yeah. And inside you. Inside, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. on a nervous system level, you know, yes. we're, we're these incredibly adaptive, you know, tolerant, uh, mammals. Really. I mean, mm -hmm. we can, you know, we live and you just have to look at all the different kinds of environments that humans, you know, are able to live in. And you're like, wow, mm -hmm. we're really like, some people can live in, you know, the North pole or whatever it is where people like, so we're adaptive and we can handle stress in our environment, but we can't handle, we're not built for repression. Mm -hmm. And when we're children, as yeah. Gabor also talks about, we are are faced with a terrible choice when the wound is coming from a caregiver because we we have no choice but to repress. We 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 either have to attach, right, right, attach, and then of course, you know, forget about secure attachment with a capital S. We move into you know anxious and avoidant attachment styles that start mm -hmm. for everybody, you know, at a very young age. And then they, uh, continue to, to plague, you know, the, the world, uh, in, in, in the form of all sorts of interpersonal relationships, you know, right. most, most obviously with, with romance, but then, you know, I mean, just like uh, parenting with your boss, you know, yeah, your boss classic, like, you know, who becomes a, you know, a, a people pleaser that mm -hmm. Gabor has a lot to say about that, you know? And uh, who wants to, uh, who he, he talks about what it's like to you know, like, you know, need to be needed the way that mm -hmm. he needed to be needed as a medical doctor. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's all, unfortunately, I always tell my clients that, unfortunately, this thing, this like cliche thing to say that, you know, childhood, um, it all comes back to your childhood. Um, yes. 
I, it's 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 an un, it's a it's an inconvenient truth to use the Al Gore language there. Yes, because, because you're like, well, great, you know, somebody hears that and they go, great, well, that's over. So, so now what, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but what you're saying is, I mean, there are many different ways to approach that problem. So when people give me that, when they make that point to me, I say there are things we can do in the now to kind of see how it's affecting you now. But right. what you're but but what you're saying is in a somatic therapy session with or without ketamine, which I'm just about to get to, I promise. Sure. Um, our, our goal is to allow the body to revisit some of these circumstances, even once again, that may be out of our kind of narrative awareness mm -hmm. and bring them to completion. And when we do that, the goal again, the overarching goal that we talked about is helping the nervous system get back into this flexible state. It doesn't need to be stuck in a particular state when it's not holding on to that anymore. Correct. Okay. Yep. So what, when you described this, what a session might look like, is this what it would look like if someone is on ketamine? Because I know, by the way, just to frame this for folks, I know now you're already doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So people are, are under the influence of the medicine while you're doing these sessions with people. Yeah. So uh, ketamine is not a classical psychedelic. That's mm -hmm. why it's legal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also why, uh, you're able to stay on your other psychiatric meds. Mm -hmm. Um, for the most part, you, you, mm -hmm. you can take, you know, um, a Xanax or a Benzo, you know, mm -hmm. the night before essentially, but everything else is okay. Essentially won't like SSRIs um, and SSRIs, yeah. mood stabilizers, yeah. a, a sleep, a sleep medication, you know, that's built mm -hmm. up in your system, ADHD meds, stuff like that. You can, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, uh, the, the effects ketamine is, it's not a classical psychedelic and it's not classified as a psychedelic medicine either, right? It's a dissociative mm -hmm. anesthetic mm -hmm. that at lower doses, can occasion a psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it consistently occasions, brings about um, some sort of um, journey-like experience for people, but it varies widely as to um, what, what that looks like and feels like, even mm -hmm. Even if two people are taking the same dose, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of mystery there, really. Um, mm -hmm. and, and 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 what it does consistently, though, especially at the at higher doses, therapeutic doses, you 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 leave the body with ketamine, um, and that is great for people with chronic pain and chronic issues, and probably chronic dizziness. I'm sure you know just because you don't leave the body. You know, the only other times that we are leaving our bodies is when we're going to sleep, really, you know, mm -hmm. meaning just like, I I'm not me right now, right? I'm me, but the, the brainwave state has changed drastically, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and so ketamine puts people into an in-between space. It's in between sleeping and being fully awake and conscious. Mm -hmm. um, and in that space, for some people... Um, unconscious material, subconscious repressed material can arise. Uh, it, can, it can come up in the form of images. It can come up in the form of feelings or intuition or downloads. Mm -hmm. um, people come back from their journeys and they say, I, I got a sense that my deceased mother was, you know, there with me or whatever it is, or I got this sense or I saw my, you know, I saw my son and he was a or Z and, um, so, so, uh, things come up, but mostly what happens that is consistent and important is this timeout effect, right? Where we know neurologically the default mode network of the brain, that's essentially the correlate of the ego. It seems to turn off other areas of the brain start to communicate with each other that don't normally communicate with each other. So in mm -hmm. that is very much like the other classical psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD and and DMT and stuff where, um, mm -hmm. you know, parts of the brain are talking to each other, right. That don't, that don't normally talk to each other. And for whatever reason or myriad reasons, that, uh, experience ends up being incredibly regenerative and, um, 
And that's, that's the essence of a, of a, essentially of a, of a deep, you know, of a, of a ketamine experience, which, which you can't, what you don't get to do on, on higher therapeutic doses of ketamine is directly engage with your parts the way that you would, uh, during an LS, uh, LSD, psilocybin or an MDMA session, mm-hmm. you know, you're in your journey. When I, I work with clients and, you know, we do some prepping, we do some breath work, they get comfortable. They take mm-hmm. their ketamine lozenge, they hold the solution in their mouth for 12 minutes, they swish it around. I guide them through a, a guided meditation that grounds them in their body. They spit out the solution and then they have an eye mask and headphones on and they lay back and they're in the ketamine space, the journey space for about 45 minutes. And we're not talking during that process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you start to talk as soon as people start to feel embodied again. Okay. Um, so when and, they're still flexible, when that flexibility is still yeah. happening. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are people working with lower doses of ketamine mm-hmm. that are referred to as psycholytic doses. Mm-hmm. Um, this, 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 that term was coined back when people were doing research with LSD in the fifties and sixties, and they would give people small, smaller amounts and, and, and basically you know, engage very actively with them during, during talk mm-hmm. therapy. Um, mm-hmm. I've tried some of those sessions. I didn't, I didn't go to that training. I went to mm-hmm. the training that I went to to work with ketamine was in this model where you give people a higher dose. Mm-hmm. You, you, you essentially you're encouraging a deep journey that's personal and um, mostly unaccompanied essentially for those 45 minutes. I mean, they know that you're there, but you're not intervening. So, mm-hmm. you know, if I see a client going through a period that looks a lot like turbulence, I always use like a plane analogy, right? So we yeah. Want- Sometimes there's turbulence during take during during takeoff, and then you want to reach cruising altitude, and then you want a smooth landing, you know, in your journey. Um, but I, I'm not, I, I will not intervene unless the turbulence is significant enough to warrant an intervention, because mm-hmm. that's their process. That's their process of coming to uh, surrender, mostly mm-hmm. to lack of control, you know, um, mm-hmm. which 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 is the root. You know, this is everybody's. Uh, major uh, consideration, I would say, when when approaching significant psychedelic work. Can you get, you know, what's a bad trip? A bad trip is I couldn't surrender to the medicine. Or like Terrence McKinney used to say, or you didn't take enough. Mm. Really. Mm-hmm. You know, you took, you took a so dose. That would force you to surrender. Right. <laughs> you took a conservative dose, right? right. I was being conservative. And you're in this in-between space of I want to surrender, but I can't. Right. You know? So um well, I have to tell you, you're scaring my audience right now. I can just hear them at, at their computers or their phones or whatever they're watching. And they're saying, I can't surrender control because these mm. folks, again, are God bless them. This is something so common for people with chronic pain and chronic dizziness, especially when they've had a scary experience, when they feel like their bodies have betrayed them. So yeah. 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 So how do you how do you help people work through those fears when they're when they're coming? coming to you knowing that this is something that could help them. Yeah. Um, so far I am working with clients, um, who for the most part are, um, they're very Mm -hmm. open-minded, um, and, and perhaps some of them even have previous experience with psychedelics. So Mm -hmm. there is a bit of an apples and apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. It's not the general public, like some guy off the street or some gal from. uh, Yeah. 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 But, 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 but the common thread there would be the desire to feel better. Right. Oh, that's why they're there. So maybe you've never had a psychedelic experience and maybe you're, uh, you know, maybe you struggle with surrender. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're still, you still show, you know, you're showing up. Here you are. Yeah. Here you are, yeah. Here are listening to this, to this interview. Sure. Yeah. Because it, yeah, concept, it is an interesting, like, um, we're asking people to, uh, be willing to edit particular scripts essentially around surrender that have served them so much in their life. Right. Yeah. So, so things happen and you have to get tough right? This mm-hmm. idea of getting tough in the face of adversity when you're a kid. And exactly. that's made me the person I am today. And that's why I'm so successful because I'm motivated and I'm particular and I'm, you know, OCD with my, you know, with my activities and my routines or whatever it is. And so those people, those archetypal personalities, they're, they're going to have 
there, there might be more turbulence at the beginning of a journey. And that's, and that's what it is. Um, but by the third or fourth time you sit with the medicine, you will be much more familiar with this space. You will know how to navigate the space and you will be a more experienced journeyer essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, and that's a beautiful thing. And at first, so it's, you're saying there are two big benefits here. First of all, we kind of touched on this earlier. Part of the experience is, is having the experience of surrendering. And yeah. if that's something that you find hard, it's actually something worth working on. I mean, sure. cause we talk about that a lot, accepting symptoms. Yeah. I mean, accepting them in the moment, not, not accepting them. Like I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life, but being with the experience of having a symptom yeah. right now and, be, and just not trying to stop it. Yeah. Do, do, but the, yeah. Go ahead. But then also it could be a, a, a big opening to you actually feeling better. And, and that's where I was going to ask you. So have, has this helped people with chronic physical symptoms? Have you seen this help people? I, I have, um, yeah, I mean, you know, well, let's talk about sleep, right? Is sleep a physical issue, right? It, right. It, it, it sounds like one to me, right? It's sure. So I have seen a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. already work with ketamine, work with other medicines like ayahuasca, mm -hmm. but even with ketamine, um, something about these journeys helps people's nervous systems and melatonin, you know, production, uh, in such a way that, that their sleep cycles regulate, mm -hmm. you know, start, start to regulate. Yeah. And yeah. that's huge. That, that yeah. is huge. Um, yeah. And then just, just to touch again on the surrender piece, like I do, I do offer a mantra that's borrowed from the MDMA world of MDMA research, which is trust, mm -hmm. surrender, receive. And we always joke about it because it's like, T, they, they forget it. You forget the mantra, but, um, having a meditation practice or having a mantra practice, for example, and, and being able to come back to it or, or, or even just having a yoga practice and knowing that you can, um, access your nervous system by conscious breathing, mm -hmm. um, you know, stuff like that is, is, is super, is super helpful, you know, cause we, you, you want to show up to, academy experience or any psychedelic experience feeling somewhat resourced, mm -hmm. you know, um, and some people do and some people don't <laughs> to put right. it like that. Um, yes. Yes. You know. And I've seen that as we to spoke about off air, I think we were yeah. talking about people just coming in and getting their aid infusions or whatever. Exactly. I'll, I'll also mention for your patients who don't think surrender is important, so to speak. Yes. Um, I ha I'm wearing, I, I happen to be wearing this, uh, shirt, which is, uh, um, it, there's an organization called heroic hearts, the heroic hearts project. I met the founder at, um, the ketamine training that I went to mm -hmm. and what they do is, uh, connect, they raise money to connect, uh, veterans with, uh, PTSD to plant medicine centers around the world. Mm. Um, and you know it's super important work and the veteran suicide rate is out of control and veterans with chronic pain and mm. you know, chronic x and tinnitus to yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and i had a convo with the founder jesse gould at the at the retreat and i was telling him it's interesting i was telling him how much i love this medicine um that's called san pedro which mm -hmm. is a cactus that grows in the andes and it's the psychoactive compound is mescaline and it's it's a, it's a medicine that you drink during the day and it's so beautiful and it reconnects you with life and butterflies and the earth and the mountains. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, you should really think, I was, you should really think about starting to work with some of these, you know, San Pedro centers as well for your veterans. And he listened to my description and he was like, yeah, that's not going to work for veterans. And I was like, Hmm, that's what, what do you mean? It's not going to work. He goes, veterans have to surrender and they need a medicine like ayahuasca. Um, which, which definitely forces people into states of surrender. You know, mm -hmm. there is, there is very little permission. And, and when we talk about turbulence, the turbulence that I'm describing with the ketamine journey compared to the turbulence that I experienced with my exorcism and other people experience with ayahuasca mm -hmm. very much, uh, you know, I, that's, I don't even know. It's just a whole other, the, mm -hmm. the language isn't, isn't appropriate. You know, one is like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable for a little while. And the other is like, I'm pretty sure I'm dying. 
Yeah. 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 So, um, so, so he, again, if that's what, that's what they need, they need, and their training of course is all about never surrendering, you know, and, and, um, fighting till the last breath, so to speak. So, um, yeah, it was really interesting. But that, that, that's always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I always give that example for people or clients who are coming in who are interested in ayahuasca and other things and other medicines. And mm -hmm. we talk about this, the extent to which they feel like they could use, um, a journey that, that uh, submits, you know, them essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's like, we talked about, I, I don't know that we said it this explicitly, but there's, it, it, this is not, this is not an easy or smooth process. If, if we're going to help reconnect someone to something that's been, that's been hidden under layers of pain, yeah. we're going to have to experience the pain to get to it. For sure. And we can either continue to experience pain and dizziness long-term, or we can be willing to face it in this way, uh, perhaps, you know, again, I'm not saying everyone needs to take psychedelics, but we need to, in one way or another, the interventions that we use when you're, you're talking about, um, you know, sensory, wait, what, what was it called again? Psychomotor? Sensory motor. Yeah. Sensory motor. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Sensory motor psychotherapy yeah. um, or somatic experiencing. And I, yeah. I, I mentioned I'm, I, I use IFS. This is, it is not, it's not easy and it's not comfortable, yeah. but it, it, it is, we have to experience, we have to experience what's really there in order to get through the, to the other side. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So, okay. But actually, so kind of on that topic, one of the questions that I was asked to ask you, um, ketamine you, you mentioned is a dissociative. One of the most bothersome symptoms that people experience from chronic dizziness is dissociation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, again, I know you've worked with people with post-traumatic stress disorder who are experiencing dissociation and arguably anyone who's going through some kind of chronic physical symptom probably has some degree of dissociation from their body. But yeah. is have you found that that particular component is uncomfortable for people when they feel dissociated or is it so it's a it's a good question and it's come up uh, uh, it's come up a couple of times actually in these like ketamine uh, um, email threads that uh, you know practitioner email threads that I that I get mm -hmm. um, and the consensus so right now in the field in terms of uh, prescribing ketamine to somebody with active dissociation symptoms is it's okay okay. And great. And what some people are report. I've, I've read it on the page. I, I, what they say is I dissociated from my dissociation. Wow. I went, you know, I was dissociated. I was feeling dissociated. I was not embodied when I sat down for my treatment. Mm -hmm. And then I had an experience that, sh that changed that channel and that was welcome. Right. Okay. So great. That's that's the story. There, there doesn't seem to be a huge risk of ketamine inducing psychosis mm -hmm. or ketamine leaving, again, under the right circumstances, right set and setting. Um, people land. Mm -hmm. They land. And when they land, they're more, they're, they're usually more embodied. Right. Right. Okay. That's, that was along the lines of my thinking, but I, I said I would ask you and I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad to hear. Yeah. It's an interesting phrase. It's, it stuck with me. The client who said, oh yeah, I dissociated from my dissociation. Amazing. From my active dissociation. Yeah. Okay. So that be, all being said though, and we had kind of touched on this in our correspondence and in the conversation we had before we went on air that we're, ketamine is what you're using right now. It's what's legal right now. But you you mentioned earlier in this conversation that you don't think of it as kind of the holy grail that there there may be other substances that would serve people with chronic dizziness and chronic pain better we are on the brink of a revolution in mm -hmm. uh, wellness mm -hmm. and uh, suffering mm -hmm. it's it's really true and and you've uh, when i think about dizziness i think about other 
related neurological diagnoses, right? Like uh, cluster headaches and chronic and migraines. migraines. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And Most so of my clients have yeah. some kind of migraine history or migraine diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. you know, psilocybin containing mushrooms, um, seem to be a kind of, um, gold standard right mm -hmm. now, um, mm -hmm. or anything that's likely like significantly neuro neurological. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. that includes TBI, right. Traumatic brain injury. And there's, there's mm -hmm. tons of interviews out there with, uh, professional athletes, uh, ex, ex NFL players and NHL players and boxers who were getting hit in the head all the time. And they've started microdosing psilocybin at the recommendation of some sort of guide essentially, and or underground therapist, and they have their lives back. Mm. Um, and so that's a whole, you know, world of exploration and, and, and we will be coming to a place where there are, um, um, above ground, you know, practitioners that you, that, that people can see to get on the right kind of dosing regimen for them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, but when it comes to microdosing, um, there's, uh, there's very little, there's very little risk, mm -hmm. um, for, for, you know, um, it's essentially injury and self-harm and stuff like that. It's a very, mm -hmm. it's this background, you know, sort of, uh, uh, cumulatory, you know, experience essentially mm -hmm. where, where you're taking something, trace amounts of something over time. And then mm -hmm. sure enough, um, people feel better. Um, and, and, and I know the research on this is, is not there yet, but, but, yeah. but is your, again, your edu very educated opinion here that we are in a way provoking some kind of neuroplastic process by microdosing? Yeah, it seems that way for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, it's a, it's another big topic in the field right now. There's, there's mm -hmm. a couple papers out there that suggest that microdosing that we, we can see the, the neurological changes. And then there mm -hmm. are other papers that refute that idea. And they say, I know it's all placebo. And mm -hmm. truthfully, as you know, and your patients know, they don't care, right? They don't right. care. Who cares if it's placebo or it's chemical? Nobody yeah. Cares. Yeah. Who cares? They just don't want to be in pain. Yeah. So people hear that and they go, oh, it's placebo. It's not real. It's like, uh, right. no, it is real. It's your brain doing its thing with, with its endogenous, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, neurochemicals, neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, be beautiful. Let, let it do its thing as you take this medicine, this natural medicine that grows out of the ground that's been, that's been growing out of the earth for right. forever, you know? Um, so yeah, we're on the, we're on the, we're on the edge of, of all of that coming, you know, becoming much more available. And it's not to say that it's not available anywhere now, like we were talking about, but, um, you know, not everybody's going to get on a plane and go, go to Oregon right. and find their way to a state sponsored, you know, facility or go to a retreat. I went and did a training with psilocybin in, in the, I was, I was just about to ask, cause yeah. we've been talking about microdosing, but this is, we're talking about, I think, I think you and I are most excited about the potential of, of macro dose. I mean, of psychedelic assisted therapy with a macro dose of, of psilocybin mushrooms. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure, so, yeah. and, and do you think, again, this is, I know this is conjecture right now, the research isn't there yet, but mm -hmm. just based on what you do know, do, do you feel that, that that could also that and or MDMA could also uh, open the door to people achieving the kind of healing that you had from ayahuasca, where they're able to process and work through traumatic experiences, yeah. emotions. I would say that MDMA is a better medicine mm -hmm. for most Americans mm -hmm. than ayahuasca. That mm -hmm. is, that is a big statement. And yeah. it's, and it's, and the reason that that is true, I think is because um, MDMA is also not a classical psychedelic, so it doesn't induce a state of ego dissolution and you don't have visions generally mm -hmm. you know, with, with, with MDMA. What you have is a profound sense of safety and it's a heart opening medicine mm -hmm. and it blankets the fear center of the brain in such a way that old memories surface and we can really look at them and be with them 
without the nervous system doing its normal thing of overactivation, overstimulation. Right. right? So the, the 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 veteran with PTSD in who got the placebo during the during the MDM, MDMA session, you know, I feel for that person because when they're encouraged to think about the war and the battles, it's very likely that they will approach a panic attack. Right. You know? And if you're given the MDMA, you don't. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. It's still not pleasant. This is not taking right. MDMA to see with your friends and going dancing. Right. This is. This is. Oh my God! The magnitude of this experience is happening again. But for some reason, this time, it's safe to explore. Right. Well, and this is. This is kind of trauma. What we're trying to accomplish, or what we've been trying to accomplish, I suppose, and all with all these different modalities of trauma therapy over the years, essentially, it's helping someone revisit and reprocess these experiences, these feelings, these emotions in a different way, from a different space, from a, I hate to use the word regulated state, but it, from a from a a different place. So that's what you're saying is that basically the medicine provides that that different space, and then. Again, I, I just want to clarify, just because I think people are going to need us to draw this together, we're not just talking about PTSD, anxiety, and depression. No. Physical symptoms are the same. They're a different manifestation of exactly the same problems. I just want to make sure that I'm I'm we are on the same page on that. Okay. There, yeah. yeah. Western medicine and the medical model has is 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 incredible and uh the the mere fact that people get stuck in states of chronic suffering suggests that there's something missing from yes. that paradigm and 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 so you know here we are and we we've um you know uh, again it's very cultural and it's very cartesian it's very um, puritanical in many ways, right? It's very much a, 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 um, other cultures don't see that, don't see the world this way. They don't, you know, there are cultures around the planet that, um, are, have animistic worldviews, you know? And so everything's right. fused with spirit. Right. Who, Everything. This compartmentalization, this mm -hmm. separation of mind and body. If you have a vestibular problem, if you have dizziness, then the problem is obviously in your vestibular organs. It has nothing to do with anything else that's ever happened to you. I, I'm the first person to ask these folks sometimes, what was happening in your life at the time when the symptoms started? Sure, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, mean just, you know, I think the, the war, I also, you know, I, I've had my issues in life, gastrointestinal. Not surprised. Not surprised. To hear that. <laughs> when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I was getting a lot of bacterial mm. infections. I did many, many rounds of Cipro, of a, you know, strong, um, you know, bac bacterial um, cleansing, you know, mm. strong antibiotics, really, really yeah. strong, broad, broad spectrum antibiotics. And then I started to believe that, that that was, you know, that chronic, that history of taking these medications had, you know, stripped my gut microbiome and it's never going to be replaced and all this stuff. I start to believe these stories, but I brought that up because if we could just start with one specialty in, in, in the medical field and it, and it was just GI doctors, right. And we could just have those people starting to educate their patients about PPDs, right. Mm -hmm. and, and psychophysiologic and disorders. Yes. Mind body disorders for anyone yeah. who doesn't know what a PPD is. Because if you yeah. don't, if you can't sit, if you don't understand that anxiety makes your stomach hurt, then you don't remember being a child, right? right. You don't remember going to the nurse with a tummy ache. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the time the nurse maybe gives you ginger ale and you, you, you chill out on the couch, but really the nurse should say, well, what happened in class, Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, so and so made fun of you, and it hurt and hurt your feelings, and now your stomach hurts, right? We we know in our gut with that with that language, right? That that the gut mm -hmm. is where the emotions live, mm -hmm. um, and so when the when the loop gets thrown off, right, and the programming is is interrupted essentially and becomes dysregulated, uh, we don't we shouldn't look any further usually than psycho you know psycho spiritual mm -hmm. stuff essentially. Yes emotional, emotional stuff. And we also know now that the, the gut is full of serotonin. It's where most of the serotonin receptors are. So like, you know, none of this stuff should be a mystery, essentially. Right, right, right. And, and like, 
as you said, I mean, I, I, I always encourage people by all means, let's make sure there's nothing horribly wrong with you. Let's make sure there are no growths or diseases that we can knock out with a medicine or a surgery, sure. but, but people watching this channel for the, the vast majority of them know there's nothing wrong with their bodies or there is something wrong, but it doesn't fully explain the symptoms they're having. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, you know, um, we <laughs> culturally, Dr. Sarno, he mentioned something that's really interesting, which is that, um, at the time that he started to diagnose all these people with their back pain symptoms, having back pain became fashionable. Yes. So it entered mm -hmm. the collective consciousness. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we've moved through our society, these different, you know, a couple of years ago, like food sensitivities and gluten was yes. like, and in public enemy number one, and like, oh, have you mm -hmm. cut, have you cut gluten? Have you done, have you cut dairy? And it's like, my understanding of all that is if you're, if your nervous system's regulated and you've done the work, then your body's closer to, to a place where it can handle most, most food. things. Again. Yes. Agreed. But, but sure, of course, right now you're, you're very dysregulated, so you can't touch that stuff or it'll right. trigger you. Right. You know, exactly. That's, that's exactly it. Mean, that stuff is the enemy. Mm -hmm. Your dysregulated nervous system is the enemy. Right. Right. So, and bringing this all back around, that's, that's why I'm so excited about, about psychedelic assisted therapy. And I'm being very specific and saying psychedelic assisted therapy and not psychedelics, because I feel that it's very important for me to take a stand on this. It is not about the medicine. It's about the work that you do before, during, and after the medicine that really rewires your brain and sure. keeps the programming going. For sure. But this is because these problems, again, our, our nervous system issues going directly to the nervous system, to the source of the problem and and treating it is really, is, is really the solution. It's really the cure for it. For sure. For sure. And, and the good news is you don't have to know what it is. You know, something, a medicine like MDMA has this incredible magic where the it or the it's surface mm -hmm. during a four to six hour um, guided session. It just for whatever reason, finally, the it unlocks some sort of, you know, the storage unit, um, you know, in the back, back room, the annexes of the, of the, of the mind, things, things surface. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not random mm -hmm. on, on the medicine, you know, yeah. ketamine can engender ketamine, you know, people, other psychedelic experiences where people are having visions and think, think they're hearing things or whatever's going mm -hmm. on that, really like hallucinatory can mm -hmm. feel very random and feel like, well, that mm -hmm. doesn't, that doesn't make any sense, but a medicine like MDMA and the right dose of psilocybin, for example, what comes up has to come up. It's supposed to come up. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's another good point that frequently people say, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be working <laughs> on. Yeah. They, yeah. Can't, they can't pinpoint a right. particular big T trauma. Right. And, so, and they're not entirely, you know, educated and they don't really believe this piece that you alluded to about, you know, um, attachment wounds. And, you know, that's why I, I do, uh, I come back to Gabor's idea about, you know, trauma is what was and what wasn't. Right. You know? So this concept of neglect and, and um, essentially like going to your room and self-regulating, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, is is for, for for a number of evolutionary biology reasons, right? It's very unnatural. Mm -hmm. It's very unnatural and unhelpful for a human to sit in isolation, you know, with his or her like you know suffering, um, you know. And uh, he talks about the fact that in hunter gatherer cultures and a lot of indigenous cultures, babies are never put down, right? right? Literally, they're just they're it's skin to skin contact all the time, you right. know, until they can walk, um, right? You know, so if the mother's regulated, then the baby's going to be regulated, you know? Right, um, right. But even into young adulthood, I mean, look at what the pandemic did to, to people, the, the, that, for sure. that isolation and that, again, it, it just, to me, like we said earlier, 
it brought those wounds back up. I think that men, oh. in many cases they were pre-existing wounds, like little things, you know, again, not necessarily big T trauma, but like little moments oh. in your childhood when you had to regulate yourself. But then being in isolation for three years, just, just pressed on that button. There's a, there's a magazine that's in most like psychiatry and therapy offices, which is psychology today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I read, I had a subscription at the time and I read in like, I think it was May of 2020, two months mm -hmm. into the pandemic, I read an article that said a lot of people are experiencing old trauma, you know, surfacing for them. And I read it and I went, Oh, that's interesting. That's, 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 that's interesting. That's not going to be me. And then a month later it was me. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, that, that, that was real. Same, 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 yeah. same. Yeah, it was. And, and, but I think that's one of the reasons also why, unfortunately, we're seeing an explosion of psychophysiologic disorders right now, oh, chronic yeah. pain, chronic dizziness. There's a reason that, that it's getting as much attention as it is. And it's because the people, there are so many more people who have it, plus the, the of course, the opiate crisis and all, all that. But oh, yeah. Um, yeah. there's, there are so many people suffering from this. And I'm so just like you, I'm so optimistic, but cautiously optimistic, because I think there are some cultural things that we're going to need to do to make sure this is done right. But for sure, but, but also like you, I'm so optimistic. We're on the brink of a, of a revolution that is going to help so many of the people who visit my channel and are suffering. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, it's, I, I think it, um, if, if there's an idea that, uh, might be particularly helpful, it, it's that, um, like, cause I remember when I was in pain that I, I got to a point where words like this there, you receive them, but they really don't, they're not landing because you still have, because you're still in pain. The pain itself yeah. is such a powerful deterrent, right? Don't believe these people, so to speak, whatever. It's just like, yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, psychedelics and, 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 and psychedelic like technologies that are, that are, that are coming essentially, um, they blow that, they, 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 they drop a, they drop a bomb, so to speak in that particular, um, the, the, the nature of that, of that pain pattern. Mm -hmm. they, really, they really do. They really come along and blow it up. And as soon as you get a taste, so to speak, of a different state of being and consciousness, uh, you start to believe again. Yes. That that things are possible. And so that's, you know, there's no other way to come to believe, really, you know. Other must, than experiencing it. Yeah. 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 We, must, we must feel into it. Yes. And then maybe it doesn't last, but but you remember again, you know, yes. life without your dizziness or life without your pain. Um and yes. it's, 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 and that becomes the motive, the new motivator mm -hmm. so, and a much better motivator than some people talking about it. Much, much better. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. Yeah. Ari, you have been so generous with your time and your expertise. I cannot thank you enough. I really feel like we could go on for another three hours. Uh, so maybe we'll have to make a part two sometime. Sure. But yeah. Let's check back in, uh, you know, when we have some other. Yeah, medicine. I know. I know. So, I know. I know. I'm so I'm waiting for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So if, if people do want to get in touch with you, work with you, I know again, right now, ketamine is, is legal. So you're doing ketamine assisted therapy in Brooklyn. Yep. Yep. So, um, I will post your website information cool. in the video description. Yeah. Um, do you have any other social media accounts or anything that people? Oh, that's, that's the main, you know, my email's on there and, um, okay. You know, I'm, I'm very open to having uh, chats with people if they're interested in plant medicine, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I did mention that, you know, I'm, I'm super excited for MDMA and I think mm -hmm. it's a great, you know, particularly special. It's a special medicine that's uh, maybe even more relevant, applicable to, you know, a lot of people. But but that's not to say that uh, traditional plant medicines don't offer their own um, incredible healing uh, magic. And mm -hmm. so and I'm always open to talking to people who are looking to explore that. And I recommend they read people's books like, like Joe Tefer, for example, that's I'll pretty much that. the, yeah. the best. I think it's the best book out there right now on, um, you know, ayahuasca and, 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 and shamanism. Um, and so, uh, 
yeah, if anybody wants to chat about that, they can reach out. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Thanks and, for having me. Oh, absolutely. And of course, anyone questions, comments, drop them below, like, share, subscribe, the whole deal. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Ari.